Okay, <clears throat> so now I'm actually ready to start. Uh, so, as you may or may not know, my name is Naomi Cedar, uh, and I probably have the dubious distinction of giving the most sensational PyCon talk in history. This was not something really that I chose, but it's the way it is. Uh, and of course, the title then is Farewell and Welcome Home, Python and Two Genders. Uh, first of all, I want to make a disclaimer here. What I'm going to tell you is my opinion and my life. I'm not necessarily speaking for anyone else. Uh, you can look at this as a way of saying you can't call BS on this. It's my life. Um, this is not, as you might guess, this is not an easy talk for me to do. Um, I've given shorter, or rather, versions to smaller audiences in the past, and unlike uh, some other talks, this does not get any easier. Um, and in fact, when I was proposing this talk, when I was thinking about proposing this talk, uh, someone who is actually fairly influential in the Python community told me, you know, a lot of people might not like this talk. They might be offended by this talk. Ironically, that just made me more determined to give it. And I think the reason for that is um, the Laverne Cox quote that's here. If you're not familiar with Laverne Cox, she's a transgender actress uh, who is very, very popular in the Netflix Orange is the New Black. Uh, she has also become a spokesman for the transgender movement or community in general. Uh, and she has said just fairly recently, it is revolutionary for any trans person to choose to be seen and visible in a world that tells us we should not exist. And I guess the past few years I've found myself a revolutionary in spite of myself. So many, many years ago, and no, I'm not going to say how many, I was born in a small town in Nebraska, and the doctor declared it's a boy. He was wrong. In fact, as it turned out, uh, I was transgender. Uh, what that means is that sometime before I was born, the chemistry and structure of my brain through a complicated series of factors that we don't even really know for sure what all they might be, uh, partly genetic, partly epigenetic, uh, but there's the structure and chemistry of my brain actually had ended up being female. Um, it happened. So I think it's an important distinction to make. Um, growing up, I didn't want to be a girl. It's not something I chose. Inside, I was. And this, obviously, I'd say particularly when you're growing up in a small town in Nebraska a long time ago, uh, was very hard to understand. What I did know is that it was not something people approved of, and I could never, ever tell anyone. Then eventually, I was about 13 years old, I ran across uh, an article in Look Magazine. You have to be really old to remember Look Magazine. It was a cousin of Life Magazine back in the day. Um, and they had an article, actually it was in an issue with Steve McQueen's macho face smeared all over the cover. They had an article about this new and weird phenomenon called transsexuals. And I realized that's what I was and that was even worse than I thought. Uh, so these are just a couple of snippets from this article. Uh, interestingly, this article came out uh -huh. years ago, uh, but when I ran across an actual copy of it last year, I had remembered whole paragraphs of it. That's how much I read this. Uh, so transsexuals share a common trait. They are deeply troubled people who live extraordinarily complicated lives. Uh, what they meant by that is that if you were transgender in those days and you wanted to do something about it, you had to do what I call is entering the trans witness protection program. That is, you were expected. In fact, it was a condition of getting treatment that you leave behind your former life entirely. No one must ever know. Um, and then, I, I love this lovely bit about what causes uh, there, there might be. Um, you know, it could be something cheery like a congenital sickness of the mind uh, or something glandular. So, as a 13-year-old with nobody to talk to, when I read the, that, that particular article, it was pretty clear what I had to do. I had to not be this. Whatever I did, I could not be this. Oops, sorry about that. 
I also need to not talk so much. Uh, so I went on basically uh, the way that I survived uh, in that particular environment. Um, I mean, it's my humble opinion that I sucked at being a boy is the way I was expected to be back in that environment. Uh, I didn't drive tractors. I didn't tear engines apart. I didn't do all sorts of these things. Uh, so the way that I survived was by being a geeky kid. Uh, I did science, physics, astronomy. Uh, I made telescopes, which was admittedly a very, very odd thing. But at least it was something that people understood. So here, in fact, I am on the right with my good friend Dave on the left. We're, we're, we're still friends. Um, and, and, and this is, I think, at about the age of 14, something like that. Uh, and it's an article in the newspaper about this really weird thing, kids actually doing astronomy. How strange can you get? Um, and I might add my little tagline there, we will never speak of this picture before. It is one thing trans people do not really care to rehash this much. Uh, I throw this in, I guess, to add artistic verisimilitude, but it's not something that I'm really fond of. So things went on that way for a long time. And I stayed just as geeky as ever, although, in fact, I switched my geekiness to uh, Greek and Latin and went on to get a PhD in uh, Greek and Latin literature at Wisconsin. Um, and then, actually, partly... Uh, when I was in grad school, partly when I was uh, over in Greece teaching at a school there, uh, I became interested in computers. I learned to program uh, AppleSoft Basic, Apple Assembler. I had this Apple IIc with a Greek character chip in it, so at random times it would flip from Roman characters to Greek characters. Uh, I loved that little machine. Um, and then eventually in the 90s, I discovered Linux, open source software. I loved those. So, um, in fact, I liked them so much that I started a lug. I'm not crazy about this picture either. Um, and that lug actually ran for a number of years. Uh, and then it was actually in 2000 I learned Python. I was at a Linux world where Guido was giving day-long tutorials in Python. I took it. Uh, I loved it. Uh, I liked the Python community. Uh, I was uh, at a school at the time. And we had all of our kids take programming, so I switched the curriculum immediately to Python. Uh, I was really getting sad about the prospect of having to teach all ninth graders Java. That just made me want to cry. Uh, so, you know, I, I ended up giving talks to various PyCons and things like that. Uh, I've got a book that is actually, I'm fortunate enough that it actually sells and I get actual money for it, which is kind of weird. Um, I ended up uh, organizing, uh, helping with the uh, PyCon, uh, basically because I made the mistake of asking Steve Holden one day, is there anything I can do at all? And he said, well, yes, I'd like a poster session. Can you organize that, please? Um, and uh, I even somehow, and that still baffles me to this day, made it into the Python Software Foundation. So all of those things were really good. Uh, but I was still transgender. And it's kind of hard to explain what that's like, particularly over a long period of time. Uh, I will tell you that almost no transgender person I know actually buys the trapped in the wrong body thing. This seems to have been come up with by uh, a journalist who wanted something snappy. Uh, it's not the wrong body, it's my body. There are things that aren't quite right about it. This is more like um, your shoes are always too tight. Your uh, clothes are always itching. Uh, something is always just not right. Um, and in fact, as that goes on, it's something, at least with me, that was with me absolutely every hour of every day. Um, you spend time thinking about it. You spend time thinking about the time you're wasting thinking about it. Then you spend time thinking about not thinking about it. And then you're back to thinking about it. That's sort of the way it goes. Uh, I actually came to the conclusion that the only way this was ever going to end was when I died. And I also came to realize eventually that unfortunately I wasn't dying fast enough. Now this may seem like I'm being a drama queen here. Uh, there's a statistic about transgender people. They did a survey uh, a couple years ago. 
Uh, and they discovered that about 41% of transgender people attempt suicide. 41%. A lot of people sort of raise an eyebrow at that. I find that statistic to be completely believable. Uh, and the reason is I have not known a single transgender person who hadn't come to that spot where they thought one way or another death was their only way it was going to end. Whether it was a natural death or not, but death was the only way that was going to end it. Um, eventually, and I have to admit being a little bit dim and a little bit slow sometimes, uh, eventually I realized that there was another way out besides death. And that was to actually embrace the truth and do what I needed to do. The problem is, of course, as I told you earlier on, from the time that I had been fairly young, I had been brought up with the narrative that suggested that if you were going to transition, that meant giving up everything. And there were a lot of things that I didn't want to give up. A lot of those things involved the Python community. There were other things as well, but it actually was a lot of these things that really sort of bothered me. Uh, but I actually was at the point where I didn't care if I lost everything. Uh, here again, almost every transgender person I've talked to who transitioned as, adult, as an adult has come to this sort of point. You just don't care anymore. You're willing to pay any price. So this is going to sound really corny. But then again, I think if you get to know me, you realize that I'm sort of a corny person. Um, I decided that um, I wanted to do an education summit because I've been involved in education for a long time. I taught Python for a long time. I wanted to bring all of the teachers together, whatever sort of program they were with, whether it was a, a school, a university, a community program, whatever. And I wanted to get everybody together. And I thought that if I managed to pull off this project, it would be my way to say goodbye to the community. Um, I have to admit, it was not one of my better ideas. I think the education summit was actually a great idea. The using it as my farewell turned out not to be a great idea, partly because I'd severely miscalculated. Uh, for one thing, I, d I found out as I started to transition that there was no way I could wait until the education summit. So that was sort of a problem. Um, and the other thing is that I started to realize that maybe I didn't have to leave. Uh, this was a revolutionary idea for me, mind you. Um, so I decided that maybe uh, I would explore the idea of transitioning openly. What would that mean if I actually tried to stay in the Python community, for example? Well, one of the first things I looked at was the Python uh, community's codes of conduct. Uh, PyCon has one. The PSF was kind of in the process of talking about one. It wasn't actually in place when I was doing that. Uh, most of the events that I was in, really interested in seemed to be in the process of that, or they had one. Uh, that was a very, very key thing. Because, and again, this sounds silly to me as I think about it now, but my thought was, OK, so suppose I transition and I walk into PyCon, and people see me, what are they going to do? OK, I'm going to kind of give away the secret. Uh, the real answer was nothing. They didn't even recognize me half the time. Uh, but in my mind, I'm thinking, what are they going to do? Am I going to have any protection if I have a problem? So that was very important. Uh, as I started to talk to people in the community that I knew, uh, they seemed to be pretty supportive. As a matter of fact, some people really seemed almost happy by it, which was a good thing, to tell you the truth. Uh, it's really very depressing to tell people something important about your life and have them go, oh, you're so brave. Uh, that really is not a good thing. Uh, so if somebody said, hey, congratulations, that was, that was actually a very welcome thing. So uh, I decided that I would take the chance and be as open as I possibly could, which is why, in fact, I end up in places like this now. Um, and um, that is, in fact, what I did. Um, and I ended up doing some teaching at various programs. I mean. I think I got my start uh, uh, that way with uh, Sheila and, and some of the workshops that we did. Um, I ended up speaking at various places. Uh, I went to PyCon. As I say, a lot of people didn't even recognize me. Uh, actually, I had a little fun with that. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, we had the Education Summit. 
Uh, I think the education somewhat went really well. In other words, I actually ended up having probably about the best time I'd had at a PyCon, and I've been to all of them. So all of that was really positive. And my thinking is that the more open I was, not only was it easier for me, it was easier for others to deal with too. Uh, that, that sort of sent a clear signal that it was okay, nobody had to panic, and I think that really helped. I think the other thing that I take away from my experiences is, is that when the Python community says it's into diversity, they actually are sincere. So this should be where we end with rainbows and unicorns, right? Uh, and I'm afraid it's not quite that simple. So, first of all, uh, I've got about three things that I want to get through here. And one of them is, what is it really like to be an openly trans person? Um, it has its drawbacks. Uh, for one thing, it is so strange to most people that I am almost a thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I know this is a really personal question, but I have to ask you. Oh, no, really, this is so weird. I need that sort of thing. In a sense, um, there is a way in which you almost become an object because it's so strange. Uh, I am almost always the only openly trans person in the room. And you notice I qualify that a couple of times. Uh, the openly particularly... Um, the government of the UK, which is the only government I know that actually, I, I know of the, 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 the percentage, uh, the government of, of Britain actually uses as their official estimate of the rate of transgender people in the population, 1%. That's one out of 100. Which means if you say that you don't know any trans people, it means you don't know any trans people who feel that they can be open about it. That's what that means. Uh, you know many trans people. Uh, I have had the experience that sometimes people get all kind of weird just to be seen with me. Uh, this has happened several times. Uh, I guess somehow they think that people are going to know, and then people are going to assume that it's rubbing off on them, something like that. Um, and, you know, honestly, I have lost family and friends. The majority of my family no longer speaks to me. Um, but it gets better. I mean, hey. My entire life can be the punchline of a joke. Honestly, any joke that ends with, and she used to be a man, is one that is not really funny to me, trust me. Um, majority of states, thankfully Illinois is not one of those states, the majority of the states will not protect my rights to uh, rent an apartment, go to work, enter a store, go to the bathroom, or even get medical care. Um, and, if things go bad, I can get beaten up or worse. Uh, this is here. The transgender holiday, the main transgender holiday, is when we read the names of all the people who've been killed. I mean, LGBT or LGB has pride, things like that. They've got some. No, this is, this is what we've got. That's how bad it is. Uh, and I need to be honest here, too. I am white, middle class, older, have a good job with a good income. That means I'm not nearly as likely to suffer those bad consequences as somebody who is young, without a good job, a person of color, things like that. Trans women of color are, are, are the vast majority on that list we read every year. Joyful stuff, huh? So this is the price that I pay to be who I am. Again, this is not something you choose. It's something that you are. Uh, but to be honest, and it took me a while to get to this point, I wouldn't change. If I could go back to that time in Nebraska right before I was born and fix everything, I wouldn't. Um, I'm actually pretty happy the way I am. And um, part of the thing behind that, part of what I see as, as almost the value of my experience, is that I've seen some things that, that most other people haven't. Mainly, I've seen at least my worlds, both as a male and a female. Um, both as privileged and as marginalized. Now again, as, as somebody who is white, has education, has an income, all of those things, uh, I certainly still have plenty of privilege left. Don't, don't get me wrong. 
Uh, but I also know that I don't have as much privilege as I did just a few years ago. Uh, so uh, I want to tell you a little bit about that. This is kind of my second point. Um, inhabiting the world as a woman has been eye-opening, to say the least. Um, I think probably the first experience I had, or the first way that this sort of came to me, is that uh, as I started to be and get to know better other women in tech, and honestly, at least for me, the way that I got to know other women in tech once I transitioned was different than when I was a man. Um, so I got to know some people that I thought were absolutely amazing, and yet they weren't really recognized for those talents. They didn't always feel welcome or safe. And that was, I think, the big shock for me. Uh, of course, I had known about this. I had thought about this. In fact, I had some long conversations with a very dear friend of mine before I, I transitioned about, how am I going to deal with this? And she said, nah, this sort of stuff doesn't really bother you usually. You should be OK. Um, so, so in fact, what, what really struck me is, is I, I sort of talked to some of these women. I thought, wow, they're getting a crappy deal. And then what really hit me is, yeah, and this is my deal now, too. And that's what I mean. It's, it's sort of an academic exercise when it doesn't really affect you. It's a much more real thing when you realize that this is, in fact, your reality, too. And so where I am now is that at tech things, I am often the only woman in the room. Uh, I actually, at, at one Linux Fest, gave a, 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 a very different version of this talk to an audience that was all men. That was weird. Um, I have, it is now assumed that I don't understand the simplest things. Um, honestly, uh, anybody who follows my tweets knows to today uh, I, I sort of got really frustrated at a counterpart uh, who would not answer my questions. Look. Here's the response I'm getting. What would the right response be if this were working? And you say, OK, well, why don't you download this little program and try a little test? No, I don't want to try a little test. I want you to tell me what is going on. Uh, so uh, that, that's certainly there. Uh, appearance is now always a factor in all sorts of weird ways that um, I'm sure that I and the rest of the women in the room could go on about at great length. Um, I can no longer assume personal security. And this is something that has been a conscious adjustment on my part, because when I was a guy, and I was someplace where I didn't really know what was going on, as long as it was not too obviously dodgy, I wanted to go out at 11 o'clock at night. I go out at 11 o'clock at night. That's not really a smart idea for me now. Okay, It is just something that is, is changed, that I can't do it. Uh, this one is, is a personal favorite, and this is uh, actually, this was one that came up at work, but it was an interesting one. Uh, as a guy, I was a nice guy. I said, oh, yeah, he's a nice guy. And that was it. Okay. Uh, the next week, practically, next month, I think, after I transitioned, suddenly I was getting feedback that I was too nice and I was too unapproachable at the same time. Okay. How can you do that? Okay. Um, there's um, a woman named Helen Boyd who teaches up in uh, Lawrence University in Wisconsin who says, any time you run into that kind of condition where you're going to lose either way, there's probably some sort of discrimination going on. So all of that boils down to, and by all of that, I mean what I've learned being openly trans, what I've learned sort of being in the world perceived as a woman, if I'm not perceived as trans, I mean, you know, it's sort of one or the other or both, uh, is that I've gotten a much better understanding of what it means to be marginalized. And I would say I have a better understanding both because I didn't used to be and because I am now, both of those parts. So this kind of applies, I would say, in different ways, but the same basic ideas apply to pretty much anybody who's marginalized, whether it's race, whether it's uh, you know, economic status, whether it's uh, disabled, uh, any of the other things that you can come up with as well as gender, gender identity, all of those things that mean you're not part of the default group. 
what this means is that your concerns aren't, almost by definition, aren't taken as seriously. Things that are done to accommodate you are always special and extra. You know, if you want a women's size t-shirt, oh, that's something extra that the conference has to do. Uh, you want, uh, I don't know, like a halal meal, oh, that's something extra that we have to do. Whereas if you're going with what the default, the majority wants, ah, no problem, that's normal. So, uh, and then finally, there is a sense where you're never quite sure if you're welcome or not. And this is very clearly something that was not there before. And, and I'm sorry to be sort of pounding away on these things, but it is the point of the talk. If you actually do object to something or report something, whether it's a behavior or a situation in terms of the way that, that things are structured, this is the way that, that you will tend to be thought of. You will be angry for raising this thing. No matter how reasonable you are, if you do some, say something that somebody else doesn't want to hear, you will be angry. If, for example, you complain about someone's behavior, you will be bullying by mentioning it in public rather than going to them in private. Um, I sort of liken this to the fact that if somebody steps on your toe and you say, ouch, could you please not step on my toe, you're suddenly accused of bullying them because you're embarrassing them about stepping on your toe or something like that. But that is very much the reasoning that I've seen. Uh, you can be accused of trying to start a witch hunt. Uh, personally, from what I've seen, the phrase witch hunt almost always means that there are some people who don't want you to change things, that don't want to hear whatever it is you're going to say. Uh, in other words, I've never heard of a real witch hunt getting started. Um, and, and this is another good one. This is actually kind of called uh, tone policing or something like that. Uh, you can be accused of hurting the cause, hurting your own cause, because you're attacking someone. If you were nicer, maybe they would follow along. Why do you have to attack them? Uh, and if you get any sort of pushback, any sort of negative reaction, which certainly in the case of, of women complaining about sexism is very likely to happen. It's your fault. You started it. Okay. Now, all of these things sound pretty awful, but in fact, they are things that I have seen in just the couple of years that I've been around. And I know that a lot of other people have seen as well. So the interesting thing I find is that in the business case, in the business world, rather, there is actually a business case for diversity. I know this very well because I transitioned. I am also the only openly transgender person uh, in uh, W.W. Granger, which is kind of a big name around here. Uh, out of 16,000 American employees, they got me. Okay, um, But they know, and, and this came up as we were getting ready for my transition at work, that diverse groups are good because they solve problems better. They also know that skilled team members are precious. If you have somebody who knows a job and is playing a key role, it's enormously painful and expensive to the business to replace them and get somebody else up to speed. You don't want to do that. So in fact, when I transitioned in business, uh, the CTO of, of our division, actually when I was starting to tell the, the leadership team what was going on, he got really nervous and really upset until I actually came out with, I'm transgender and I'm transitioning to female. And then his response was, Oh, thank God. I thought you were leaving the company. Uh, so, uh, not exactly the, the, the but it was, it was cute. It was cute, actually. So, the thing, and I think I just hit the wrong button there. Uh, there we go. So, what it seems to me is that the open source software, and even to some extent still the Python community, have not quite seen that same logic. I think that actually, in some senses, there is still uh, a certain amount of resistance to this. Uh, it's not always overt. It's more often the sort of, uh, you know, it kind of comes down to people not wanting to change the way they've done things. Um, but, you know, there, there is a certain amount of questioning this. And if you're doubting me, I would just refer you to any discussion of codes of conduct. If you can stomach reading through those threads, uh, you will see exactly what I'm talking about, among other things. Uh, and I'm not going to go into that here. Some of us have survived that. And I know Brian back there is, is a, by far a survivor of that. 
Uh, but I would actually say that really if we're in an open source environment, if we're in an open source community, that should by definition imply inclusion and diversity. It should imply welcoming uh, people who are different in, not just tolerating them if they show up. So I am mercifully close to being done. Uh, so what do we, and by we I mean anybody who feels marginalized in some way, what do we want, what do we need, how can you keep these people happy? Um, one thing, which actually I didn't put on here, although I thought about it, is that you can actually listen to them when they tell you what it is that they want or need. That would be a good thing. Uh, not always done. Uh, some other things, uh, code of conduct. Again, honestly, and, and again, as I say, uh, people tend to minimize this. They say, look, we're all nice people here. Why do we need a code of conduct? When you're marginalized and you're thinking about entering a com community that you don't know anything about, you don't know that they're nice people. If they tell you that they're nice people, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. You actually at least, again, I'm talking about how I felt about it anyway, you actually at least want something that you can look at that says, no, look, they say that they will do this. If I get in trouble, they actually will do X, Y, and Z. They won't just say, we're nice people, trust us. Um, so that's important. Uh, outreach matters. If you actually want people who are different to join your group, you need to ask them. Just sort of saying a sort of a tagline, by the way, open to all, does not tell me anything about whether or not I'm going to be welcome. Um, allies matter. And by allies, I mean people who are willing to uh, stand with us, to stand up for us, uh, to do things like that. Uh, this is, this is actually one of the, the secrets about men that I'm going to reveal to the world. Uh, and I know this because I was undercover as a man for a very long time. And that is, uh, in general, almost never will men call out other men for things like sexism. It happens such a tiny fraction of the time that it is really amazing. I have never, let me think, I cannot recall being physically present when it's ever happened. What happens is there are a bunch of guys who are bothered by it, and they sort of laugh nervously and kind of look away and try to change the subject or try to move things on, but they don't actually stop and say, look, that's crap, you can't do that. Uh, it's a very rare thing. I think, to be fair, this is not just a guy thing, okay? It's any time where you have an in-group and an out-group the people in the in-group have a strong pressure not to sort of go against the code, as I call it, and, and, and call each other out for things that, that they used to accept is just fine. So that's, that, that's where allies really matter, is in actually being able to call things out like that. Uh, in general, for almost any marginalized group, in order to make any progress at all, you need some allies. You can't just do it by being like I am now here and banging my fist on the table saying it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. You actually need some help. And then finally, another thing that I've noticed is that safe spaces matter a lot. Uh, the, the one that I'm thinking of most of all is uh, sort of things like the Open Hatch Python workshops and the Pi Ladies things, things like that, where they've actually changed the gender balance uh, so that it's more women than men. Okay, now I have to admit back in the day I was a little bit skeptical as to whether or not that would make a difference. Having taught at those programs, I can tell you that it does make a difference. Being someplace where you don't have to worry about some other group that actually is, uh, you know, more the default than you kind of watching what you're doing is a big deal. Okay, now here, this is, is my favorite Thing to, to sort of beat on, I guess. About a year and a half ago, this comment showed up in a thread on Reddit. I don't know if anybody else saw it. Um, I actually don't read Reddit. I honestly, that would, that would be a bad thing at my age. My blood pressure is not that good. I can't stand to read Reddit. But it, this was on, in some discussion uh, about diversity, and, and it came to my attention. And it pissed me off um, because because how will free software be improved by being developed by a black transsexual woman? Uh, the speaker 
was not, in fact, really debating the business case of diversity. He was, in fact, setting up the sort of the worst possible case. Okay, if you can prove this, I'll buy anything. Uh, and I found that offensive on all three counts. Okay, um, but it is kind of a, a, a good question to ask in a way. Uh, so I'm going to end, on, uh, it's, it's my second to last slide actually, with how I would like to sort, or where I would like to drop that person down into. Uh, and that is, uh, this is all of us who participated in the first trans hack, which was the first hackathon for transgender uh, issues. Uh, we're having the third one actually starting this Friday through Sunday, uh, right here in Chicago. Uh, but this is, is the group that was there. Uh, those people are trans and non-trans. They are black, they are white, they are Latino. They're pretty much every possible combination that you can imagine. And honestly, some of them were not the most experienced developers, but over the course of the weekend, they wrote apps that considered people who were um, basically people who were homeless, people who did not have the latest technology, people who did not have access to information. In other words, they came up with a lot of great stuff that I'm pretty sure if you would have put the same number of and again, I had to, to sort of pick the default group. It's time you guys get it occasionally. Uh, if you had the same group of straight, white, cisgender men, you probably wouldn't have gotten that same sort of thing at all. So in a way, that is my answer. And this is my final, final statement. Open should be open to everyone. So thank you very much. <laughs>